Hi there. Thank you for downloading, listening to, and watching the Lean Into Artcast. This is a show where two visual storytellers get together and take on various topics that tend to cross one's path when you go off on this endeavor of communicating with images. We think hard about it, so you will too. My name is Jersey Drost. I'm a cartoonist and teaching artist, and the other host other host is named. <laughs> hey, I'm Rob Stensinger. <laughs> I am a user experience designer, uh, a game developer, and also I do a variety of, of uh, coaching for, um, you know, individuals and teams to make meaningful products. You make the products and then you help people make their own products. Uh, Yo, oh yeah. Living it, living it and teaching it. That's, <laughs> that's a thing. It's, um, it's a fun combo. It's, it's, it's great. I've been working, uh, on uh, first, like the sequel to one of my video games, but then I, I've gone back and and have have been doing an update to the classic version. So uh, yeah, we'll talk about that later. Working on uh, Guitar Fredder Classic and Guitar Fredder Deluxe both, and it's fun where it's like I'm bumping into all kinds of product development, you know, choices and puzzles. Uh, yeah, getting inspiration along the way, testing and learning from testing, and and it's just like okay. Well, you're always you're, managing, always managing that <laughs> pipe, that pipeline and that puzzle, you know, you, you're, you're, you're What's, tele- what goes into the next version. <clears throat> you're telegraphing. What is the segue into talking about what this week's episode is about is this idea of, I think, uh, part of the ethos of this project from the very start was that yes, intuition is awesome. And especially after you've done a lot of skill acquisition, it becomes sort of intuition. It looks like intuition because it becomes something that you're not. You're not going to a flow chart to make every decision that you make, right? It's like you just, just like when you ride a bike or do any kind of physical skill that you practice a lot, it feels like a natural thing to do, even though what's natural to you is a form of mastery that you've built up through skill acquisition over a long time. But that said, I don't ever trust intuition alone, right? Like I, if, I, mm. if I'm having big feelings about something, I'm excited about this. I'm reluctant about this. I'm worried about this. I'm anxious about this, or I'm angry about this, whatever big feeling you want to name. It's like, okay, okay. Well, that's signal to, for, for you to stop and assess and ask yourself, what are you trying to accomplish here? Um, and uh, so the, the, this, this idea of like a new project suddenly comes up uh, in front of you or a new technology or a new approach comes up in front of you and you feel, you feel some kind of big feeling about it. Stop and assess. And, and, and I had this experience very recently. It's been more of like a background radiation of like slowly, like, like peaking little bits of like excitement around as we've been exploring like this project. And as I've been exploring things like super comics challenge, I'm like, I want to incorporate more video into my business as a cartoonist. I'm really excited about it. I'm trying to find the time to explore it. And that excitement has turned to like frustration as I run into like uh, bottlenecks in terms of the like, amount of time I have or in terms of my understanding of what I can do. And so I thought, oh, I've got this friend that I talk with every week named Rob, who has a very, he likes to look at things from the perspective of systems and uh, inefficiencies. He'll help me understand what it is I'm so excited about and why I'm running into these frustrations so that I can approach it from a more systematic uh, systematic way and in a holistic and integrated way. So did I, did I uh, pre-summarize what we're going to do today? I, yeah, that's, that's a solid, um, I, I mean, hopefully, hopefully we deliver on that, on your prediction. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, this is, it's um it's a fun topic because I think it affects all of us who make stuff because I mean, one of the things like why you're doing this I mean you're you're intrinsically motivated from for parts of it and you're probably extrinsically motivated in a way like to to oversimplify like why we go about doing the the, the stuff we make I mean you 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 do it because you believe in it and love it but you also probably enjoy you know getting paid for it as well how do you puzzle out that excitement with you know when it encounters you know these opportunities, barriers, stuff mm. that yeah. comes in a package that looks like some neat, tempting technology. I don't know. Like, let's, let's, uh, let's explore that. I've, I've been dealing with this, with this too, but I, I like, um, yeah, I like this kind of conversation. So I'm All ready right. to roll. All right. Well, let's roll. Ah! 
There we go. <laughs> it surprises me. Still. <laughs> <laughs> Time to the music indicates we're the first part of the show where we talk about what it looks like. Um, yeah, so where do you want to start, Rob? So, okay, let's talk about your your situation. Um, what uh, what's kind of what what's popped up, and and like what why is it sort of creating this this uh, this tension and stuff? Um, so yeah, so you. you if I could broadly summarize it, this, this year has meant for, you know, we're in the middle of a global pandemic. There's a global health crisis. And as somebody who's one of his day jobs is to organize, um, uh, serve as a director of a comics festival, we had to quickly change gears and figure out, okay, how do we do this thing online? And how do we do it in a way where we're preserving the character of what the festival is when it, we can gather in place? Um, and so, you know, that meant a lot of thoughtful investigation of different streaming technologies and really asking some hard questions as to like, well, why would we do it this way instead of that way? Um, why would we use Zoom instead of, I don't know, uh, StreamYard, you know, and, and evaluating what, what all those different affordances are. And as a consequence of going through all of this careful research and applied research and practicing like things like the super comics challenge project was me doing applied research on like, how do we create an online event that teaches how comics work in a gameful way that is easy for the contestants to do and all that kind of like problem solving that you do. It's like, I'm leveling up my understanding, which makes me say like, gosh, uh, if I were to do more video with my comics projects, it seems to me, and this is this is as far as I get with my thinking. It seems to me that it would be beneficial to my comics work if I employed more video in the ways that I've been employing it for my other jobs. And I feel a lot of excitement around it, and I want to do some kind of practicing and testing about it. Haven't had the time to do it, and that's where the tension comes up. The tension comes in where it's like, I'm excited about it, but because I don't have time to do it, and I don't really have time to think about it lately because of day job stuff, um... It just becomes this background pressure of you really need to think more about that and you need to practice it and you need to like t do some testing on it. And so I haven't had the space to do that and I haven't taken the time to do the testing, but yet the excitement and the pressure is there, which makes me stop and pause and go like, okay, why is the excitement and pressure there? Um, so the technology, the the situation, it's like, um, it's, it's, it's often in a bundle of, of stuff, right? It's a scenario that that's, that's tempting. It's not just like one new trick or thing. It's, it sounds like it's, um, it's doing some streaming somewhere with your setup to some streaming venue. Uh, but then, but as a part of a project and sort of performing the work of the project publicly kind of thing. Right. Mm -hmm. So what about that? So, and, and it got, you know, th this, it's funny because, um, like falling in love with problems and solutions leads to all kinds of inf stuff that influences us. And I, I, I think yeah. that's useful. Right. Yeah. So it's like you, it's what I'm hearing is you fell in love with both the, Oh, well, maybe the, the, you must've had fun if this became tempting to apply to yourself. Right. Because it's, it's almost like, well, um, often your day job adventures doing all this applied research and then saying like, well, I could do something even more with this. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. You, know, you, you don't always get that feeling. You do something in, in, in one context or project. Sometimes it's nice to walk away, but it sounds like. No, what know, this is. So this with you. there's, we talked about this very recently on the show. It might've been on extra lean, but I, what I've, I've discovered that something, or rather I found the language to explain something that makes this cycle of creativity very enriching for me and very, um, repeatable makes me want to come back to it again and again is that when I find a way to serve a particular audience in a um, a novel way that also supports and celebrates a community of fellow creatives that I care about that hmm. like solving that problem of connecting people from my community that I care about with an audience that we are all here to serve that that really puts gas in my tank you know I, I i i can get by on less sleep i can i can eat less <laughs> you know I, I i feel more 
like like driven to do things when that is in place. And I feel like recently with the the the, the problems I've been solving um, with regard to video and making video content, I'm feeling that kind of energy. And now I look back at okay, what other areas of my life could that kind of problem solve? What other areas of my career, my portfolio of jobs, um, can I take this and maybe see how it applies there? And because like one of the things that Super Comics Challenge was me, what I was trying to address is, and I'm, I don't want to turn this into a binary this or that scenario. I want to say yes and, right? And, and as I saw a lot of online festivals moving, or rather festivals moving to online, a lot of the content they were doing was panel discussions, which the, why wouldn't you? It's, it's a natural it's a natural fit that like, okay, at a convention, you have people having a discussion together in front of an audience. The audience can have Q and a, well, gosh, that's, that's, that transports very naturally to an online setting where now you have a grid of people in zoom and then you can have people in the chat asking questions, um, or discord for that matter. Right? Like, like I'm actually going to be part of, um, a discord class tonight where we're going to be doing some live streaming like this and people can actually talk to me through the, the audio channel, which is kind of exciting. <clears throat> But then my next question is, is that, okay, but what can the technology do that you couldn't do in public, right? So like, is there something you could do with your hands that if you were in an auditorium, it'd be really hard to demonstrate this, like an origami thing. Like, let's say you do an origami and it's like, okay, well, you'd have to have an overhead cam and have it broadcast on a screen. Online, it's going to feel more intimate to do that than in an auditorium, right? The online experience will be um, more, uh, what, what would you say? Like, um, appropriate or I don't know. Yeah. It's, this is a fun thing to try to, um, uh, to, to characterize. So let's say, um, God, there's so many different, uh, there's, there's different nuances and whatnot. You, you, you know, you're affecting your project probably by integrating it with some other thing. Um, it's cause I would bet someone who is like a professional, what's an origamist? Is it an, or, are you a, yeah, good question. If, if you're know. origami if you're, artist, if you're origami artist, uh, and you are on stage a lot doing that, I wouldn't be surprised if you started integrating other things to, to create a biggerness to that whole experience. Right. Mm -hmm. You probably are starting to do dance origami or, um, laser origami or whatever, where that somehow incorporates the, like the strengths of the, where the venue where you're performing it. Right. Um, because that the, the venue affects the meat, the art, it affects the, yeah. the, you know, the performance of it and all that. Probably you may, you know, you don't have to be affected by that, but it's, I would say over time, if you think about like, you know, radio shows going to television, that's like a classic. So whatever you do like a medium, uh, yes, context yes. shift. Yes. It affects it affects the art, right? It gives and, you and new a good way to look dynamics. at it is like you look at like early television shows and they were really like stage plays. And then you had George Burns and Gracie Allen come along, like, well, let's take that and let's make that part of the experience of the show. So I don't know if you've ever watched the George Burns and the Gracie Alley show, but like mm -hmm. Gary Shandling lifted a lot of his sort of approach from that, where it's like George Burns would walk out of the set and onto the stage and sort of look at it from a meta point of view and like comment as a narrator on what's happening in the living room while the characters in the living room talking. Right. And I, and I remember watching it going like, that is such a clever hack of taking the stage play slash radio show and giving it another dimension because it's television and you could do that kind of thing. Um, and then, yes, now then you get into multiple cameras. Now you can get this like more quote unquote cinematic storytelling, but yes, that's that stuff. I find I get very, very excited about. Uh, and I think of uh, another thing is I think like Jackie Chan, when he was being interviewed about like how he choreographs his, his battle scenes in his martial arts movies, he says he walks into a room and he's like, okay, what can I use? Like what's, what is, what's in here that I can use as like a thing, like not necessarily a weapon, but like, how can I make the environment part of the battle? And so like, that's where you get in rumble in the Bronx where he's using pinball machines to, as, as, as like ways to like hinder his opponents and fight his opponents. Like they become part of the landscape that's ever shifting as he's moving them around, pressing people against walls with them and stuff like that. And I love that sort of like intentionality of incorporating all the elements at your disposal to maximize the experience so um so and uh, like 
it's 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 nice to acknowledge it. It's like putting putting the the work in a different context. It's it's acknowledging that this is going to affect the work somehow. Mm-hmm. But like, what are you what are you hoping? Like, so if you could say yeah. like, um, by doing this, I hope this affects my work in this way. I hope it affects my audience or other outcomes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you for that. That that's an awesome perspective shift because like, just because you can doesn't mean you should, right? And it's like, oh, there's all this potential in the room. Okay, well, so. <laughs> <laughs> what good does it do anybody? You know, it's like, and this is the thing that I get into when we were talking about developing kids read comics in a two calf in the early years is like, we should always come back around to what's in it for the audience. What's in it for the people coming to this thing. And like, just because we can do this thing doesn't mean we necessarily need to put any energy into it unless we can establish very clearly what good is it going to do? So what good is this going to do me? Right. Or what good is it going to do the audience? What, 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 what benefits are involved? So, when I think about like my like my art, what do I want? Well, I want people to have a way to regularly engage with my art in an entertaining way, in a way that is not an advertisement, or or rather that is not a pure advertisement, right? I want my I want to create something where the public can show up the way I showed up to the Transformers cartoon, right? Yes, I want to buy the toys. I'm also here for the entertainment of the show itself. Yeah, I know it's a commercial. Yeah, I know my mom's mad because I'm going to want all this stuff. But you also made an exciting story, and I could just show up for that part, too. Um, there's that. What do I want the public to get? Well, I want the public to, like the people who engage with it, I want them to be entertained. I want to provide some kind of value for, for spending their time with me. Um, and I want them to feel um, more connected with me as an entertainer, Right. You are now, you are now a part of my life in a sort of bounded and safe way, right? I'm not going to be coming at you saying like, "Oh gosh, you know, um, I need some work done on my roof. Can anybody help me out? <laughs> anybody want to clean my gutters?" <laughs> You know, uh, or I'm not going to come to you and be like, oh, I got into such a fight with my wife this week. Right. But like in this more, it's, it's somehow, it's a, um, a, a, like, I guess bounded is the best word I can think of. It's, it, it, there's like a, a, a clearly defined area where we are more connected than, than I am with the general public, but it only to a point because this is, um, respecting all of our boundaries. Okay, so that at some interesting um, uh, criteria. So hopes you. So you hope that um, it it's well, let's see that you can provide an entertaining experience that it's received by an audience. Then it's something. Oh, of and a then and, recurring thing. And then hopefully convert a, a portion of the audience into paying customers who will contribute to my work, either in the form of ongoing support through um, you know something like a Patreon to help fund the creation of the work or purchasing the work themselves or advocating for it by recommending it to other people. Okay. So let's see. Um, how does that, how, how do you think that that will um, like, so what, I guess what's in the way of doing this? Like what, is there is there some kind of um, other friction or some aspect of this that um, that somehow it would be impeding your project, right? Because mm-hmm. it you know what's because the describing the main project it's and so is this well let's see is this the project or is this also supporting some other thing? Um, mm. So help me like what's the what's the content of the stream? What's um, <laughs> I asked a bunch of questions there. I know. Well, this is, this is the part that you put in the notes where you suddenly walk in and turn the chair around and look at me. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's coming up for sure. Oh, okay. And this is, uh, well, yeah, yeah, I know that, that is, we're already in there. Yes, of course. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah. So what, what is, is it the project itself or is it, well, no, it, it is not the project itself. It is in support of a project. So this would be something where it's like, okay, I'm looking at um, possibly do, well, what am I talking about? Possibly. One way or another, I'm going to be drawing a graphic novel in the next year, right? Um, 
whether that's funded by a publisher or whether that's d- done by you know b- by me uh, chopping out pieces of time out of my week and sort of doing some side hustle on it, that's TBD. But the fact of the matter is, is that I need to do it. I need to be creating uh, comics work that is my own, just f- f- for my own sense of um, satisfaction of my experience of being a person. Um, so this is really me thinking about how can video support that so that whether it is to build awareness of the projects um, so that when it comes out in stores, people can go buy it or whether it's to build support for it so that people can, I can remind people that I need their support in order to be able to keep the lights on so I can keep doing this thing. So it becomes less of a side hustle and becomes my main hustle. Um, either way, some kind of Either way, I'm, I'm going to be asked by the project to get in front of it, right? And getting in front of it can look like a lot of different things. I'm looking at video and what it can do to provide me a way to get in front of it, right? Mm-hmm. So what ways, so this is, so there are multiple projects at hand. So like if, if the, um, the graphic novel project is successful, that looks like one thing. If the streaming project is successful, that looks like something. How do these how do these help each other, or how they, how do they get in the way of one another? Um, and mm-hmm. and uh, it's, or yeah, it's, how do, or how would you, streaming or, get you don't in the have way? To know that already? Well, um, I'm no. It's it's an interesting question. I hadn't thought about that. Like, well, how would streaming get in the way of doing the work of the graphic novel, right? Because the main thing is I'm going to have a year and a half of production on this thing. A um, year and a half of, of drawing it, writing it, and so on. So how would streaming mm-hmm. get in the way of that? Well, it would be very challenging, if not impossible, for me to stream while I'm writing. I can't do it. I can't talk while I'm writing. It's a very solitary thing for me. Um, so that would be something where it would definitely be, it would definitely get in the way of that. The drawing part, it almost doesn't get in the way at all because my computer is always set up to be working with uh, OBS running. Um, uh, was there any management beyond that? Well, I mean, if, if a lot of people show up, there's the potential friction of me having to attend to um, talkative participants, right? So it could... Sure. It could Being an engaging host? Yeah, yeah. So I'm I, I, yes, I'm taking on another job when I do that, right? Because I'm hosting while doing this. Um, and as I explore novel approaches to it, so I'm not just turning a camera on while I'm working because like, if, I, if entertainment is part of the mandate of the thing. And watching somebody draw is entertaining to a point, but how would I build upon that? So yes, okay, so it would get in the way in the sense of it's going to require a little bit of front-ending of me developing some approaches that create some novelty and um, a spirit of play to the thing in performance. Um, And I will have to attend to that while I'm doing the stream, which would mean that I'm not going to have as much opportunity for getting lost in the work, which is part of the pleasure of doing the work. That's a trade-off that I'll have to make um, on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. And... So noticing those tensions or constraints or whatnot, it's it may, it's not a matter of well this therefore that. It just could mean the that well they're um, they're design constraints. They should shape and influence whatever you make. That's all. So absolutely. Um, if yeah. you if you have needs of uh, private work time for whatever approach that just it doesn't fill that doesn't fulfill the enter- entertaining promise, right? Mm-hmm. Then, um, you know, that that's all right. Maybe it's a matter of, you know, th- there still could be ways to adapt. Not, I'm not trying to come up with a prescription or a, or a, no, a, you're a right. solution. And, and this kind of adapting happens all throughout the project, whether or not I'm adding on this extra layer of getting in front of it, in the sense that if I'm on a deadline where I have a schedule to meet like two pages a day, right? Well, maybe the work is going to be more rushed and I'm not going to have that chance to get lost in it the way I love getting lost in it. Right. Like even if I do work alone, because like the, the, the pressures of other outside forces are going to 
creep into the making of the thing, whether it's a self-imposed deadline or a deadline given to me by a publisher. So I feel like this is a manageable tension, right? And like you said, like that, that's, there's flexibility there. Like, let's say I say, you know, like a lot of streamers, because I've been watching a lot of different streamers, like YouTube videos, ex exploring how they all approach it. And there's some of that advice that got passed out to web comics back in like 2001, 2002, which is like, establish a regular schedule. Say you're gonna do it Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and show up all, all, always for that. And I'm like, okay, well, I, I understand the logic and the reason behind that, given that web comics operated the same way. So if I did do that, let's just say if I did, as a, as a hypothesis or as, as a hypothetical situation, um, yeah, there's going to be like, I know that Wednesday is not going to be my flow state day. Maybe Thursday will be my flow state day, right? Mm -hmm. And it just, I know that the, the trade-off I'm making is, yep, I'm creating an entertainment while also getting work done on this thing. I'm doing product development in two different arenas simultaneously with the preference leaning slightly towards one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that is an interesting puzzle because it's, um, there's, yeah, there's, there's a lot of potential hats and, um, aspects of, well, you're be, being an independent creator, uh, even if you are working for, uh, like whatever the arrangement of the project, having some kind of ongoing, uh, effort for audience growth and stuff. I mean, it's, it's just, um, that's just a part of the time we're, we're all working in right now. I mean, you make a creative thing, someone invests in it, whether it's you or someone else, then, you know, they're going to like the, you have a greater chance to see something in return. Um, you know, financial gain if you have a larger audience. So mm -hmm. that's, that, it makes sense to be trying to deal with that, but then, but inherently there's huge tension. Um, so interesting um yeah and just another interesting tension to to manage there what about your um the uh i guess my last question for this part would be how how much harmony or disharmony is there when you look at your overall goal and like needs to get to your goal and like which like do the projects you know, harmonize well or, mm. or not. Right. Like it, when you, when you consider your goal, it's like, you know, where you're trying to go with this and not that you have to go super deep personal or whatever you feel comfortable with, but it's like, um, it, it could be, what's interesting is like, it's quite possible that, uh, your goal is to, to, you know, make more, make another meaningful product, put it into the world. It's a graphic novel. Um, but like, it could be that the streaming project is actually um, closer to helping you get to your goal than, than the actual main product, right? Which is, is maybe your typical definition of like, that's my endeavor. This is what I do. Um, <coughs> I had a really, a really thoughtful friend help me begin to navigate this recently. And they said, uh, and I was talking about the same thing with, I was like, well, there's super comics challenge, which I feel like was a, um, proof of concept, not just of a specific thing, but of my ability to solve interesting problems with this, uh, with this technology. I want to put it, point it towards my comics work and see what I can do. And then throughout the conversations, they were asking me some leading questions and thoughtful questions. They said like, well, what if this turns into you doing a TV show? And like, I immediately felt like this, this twinge, like it was, it was like when you, when you, when you hit a, a, a wound that you haven't touched in a while, you know, like you got like a, a bruise or a sprain or something and you've been operating just fine. All of a sudden you hit it the wrong way. You're like, ah, ah what was that? You know? And I, and I realized that like developing and investigating this could lead to other opportunities that I wasn't looking for. Right. And like you just pointed out the streaming thing could become the product and then the graphic novel could be merely the MacGuffin that helps me uh, create a different product. I don't know how I feel about that, but that is a very good question. Because <laughs> um, I got some big feelings in, in that regard. I'm like, no, I'm doing it to make the comic. The comic is the main thing, but maybe, like, this is something else that I've been wrestling with is conceptually is like... Um, 
what if the world isn't asking for that, but they're asking for this other thing? How do you, how do you, how do you, how do you feel about that? Right. Well, I don't know. Um, a lot of my plenty of yeah. plenty of businesses and, and plenty of people have a story of of that, right? I mean, it's I would say my career is is all full of MacGuffin stepping stones. Um, I've I've had a, I've had side projects now for um well more than two I guess twenty twenty six years or so. I've been doing side projects the entire time. <laughs> <laughs> and it's always led to um, some kind of evidence that that I end up getting into other projects that are typically the stuff that is like well that that fund most of my work right or most of most of my life has been the other things that I got into because of the thing that I wanted to do. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So yeah, yeah. Anyway, so I I can understand the that that sort of tension and and. To, to flip it, because like I, I do have big feelings about this, which we could possibly take to an extra lean sometime if we really want to dig into that and like do like some I mean, <laughs> modeling, some therapy. But um, I, I, conversely, is like the teaching thing was like in 1999, 2000, when it was first presented to me, I was like, no, I will not do. What do I got to teach anybody? I have no business being in front of a classroom. Seriously, no. And like it was somebody there with a check. Like we have money. We want you to do this. I'm like, no forget it, go away, you know? And I, I was like that vehement about it. I'm like, you, that is an insult to comics to ask me to step in front of it like that, you know? Um, and then yet when I finally did it, it wound up becoming a really, not only a rewarding part of my portfolio of businesses, but it's something that is like, it's, it's an experience that I, if I don't have it, I find like it's it, my, my overall experience is lacking. Like if I don't get to work with kids in some kind of regular way to help make them more connected with comics, um, I don't feel that my experience as a cartoonist is complete. So it could be that the thing that the world's asking for also has a lot of value for me as well. Maybe I don't see it right away. Um, so I'm trying to meet these big feelings I have with that knowledge and, and temper it a little bit. <laughs> totally understandable. It's, um, it, I, 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 I think we, what do I say? I love, I, I, sometimes we have to talk about generalities and groups of people and all that kind of stuff. And, and, um, I don't, I tend to avoid defining the world as people who are creative and people who aren't. I don't right. like those kind of labels. Mm -hmm. I don't like the labels of people are makers or not or whatever, but like there are things that you can emphasize more about you that when you tend to be in, in that same group of similar emphasis of essentially people that feel some kind of need to make more stuff. And that might be stories, that might be apps or games or business, whatever it is, but you feel the need to, you're, you're, you're doing something, but then you also want to do that other thing. And it probably leads to like um, other ideas coming into, into reality. Okay. It's a weird, like early in the conversation, you mentioned a concept to me that immediately brought to mind, not a great visual, but like a face hugger, a face hugger alien. <laughs> right and it's like we are, ha are we try to have happy friends and life's life styles and careers while we have a fa uh, alien on our face that is our art career interests and other projects your main career can be doing that this the sim same or similar endeavors you know uh wearing a hat on a team that is you know producing games or art and stories and whatever right but you still got that alien on your face and it's less, it's, it's saying like, you know, make the other thing too. And you're like, yeah, okay, we'll, we'll make the other thing too. And, uh, and we're fine with it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's, that's it. Like, I think some people like take that alien and they're like, no, shut up. You're done. You know, yeah. and, and other, and, and they can do that. I've never found a way to live happily comfortably unless I've had the, that's that dang alien on my face. So, um, so we're, we're living with that while also, you know, navigating and, we're, and so it's just kind of a belief. It's a bias. It's an interest, um, that we were like, yeah, we're going to do this. So then it puts you in this scenario of like, well, all right, well, 
how many, uh, how, what do I want to do? How do I, how do I make this work? Maybe, um, it could be my main thing. Maybe it could j- continue leading to other things, but whatever it is, I just believe in it. So I'm going to keep doing this. Right. So that's one of the core, like, I think that's a, maybe this, uh, maybe kind of obvious, but, um, I just wanted to make it even more obvious thing to me. That's like this assumption in, in what we're exploring here, where, um, I think it applies to people if you're in a situation of like, yeah, my main endeavor is doing whatever project and then I still am tempted to do this other thing. But I think it has the like extra uh, applicability to folks who are like, yeah, and I'm, it's my, it's my second gig and I'm also doing this. And I, and then, and I'm still tempted to add other nuances and projects on top of the projects to, to try to make them all successful. My alien had babies and now I have alien babies on my face with this other, with the other alien. I don't know. Yeah. Hmm. So, <laughs> but I think we can, I think we can do frame this and um, like, like, like you painted in the, in the intro that um, like, we can we can be uh, systemic and thoughtful in in uh, in asking a few specific questions to to help frame frame the choice differently. That sounds Maybe great. that'll help. Yeah, that would be well. I would find it extremely helpful, and I'm I think it would be a good modeling exercise on, on the show. Um, All right, to, to think about this, regardless of what project that you're doing, because I think I think that the experience I'm describing is probably I mean, I, I know you're reacting to it from a sense of like yeah that resonates with the tensions I've I've traveled. Um, I'm certain that will be for other people who are listening to the show. Um, I don't think that my experience is so unique and so special that no one else in this universe has had it. There's, there's subtleties to it that uh, only I get to experience from my own baggage and upbringing and, and perspective. But the, the overall experience itself of trying to manage these tensions and try to, to, to approach it in a thoughtful way, I feel like is something that... 100%. Get, yeah. You're not alone. Yeah. Um, I think, I think other folks might say that you're an entrepreneurial creative. Mm. So. Okay. That's the name of your face alien. <laughs> All right. Well, let's take a break and we'll come back and look at it a little bit like, like how do we look at it systemically? So, um, before we do that, we got to thank some people who make this show possible. And those are the folks who support us on Patreon, patreon.com slash lean into art is the website that's easy enough to remember right patreon lean into art just put it together with a dot com in the middle and what is it it's a way for you to give us a monthly upvote if you say i believe in jersey and rob and what they do and i want to help make it more sustainable uh, they provide me value with week after week and i want i want to let them know that i receive value out of this you can support us for as little as a dollar a month you can cancel it at any time so you just do like a one-time you know, support and then cancel and come back another month when you have the extra discretionary income. But I want to thank five people who've been supporting us on an ongoing regular basis, month after month. It means a lot to us. First up, uh, Greg Horvath. Thank you, Greg, for believing us in what we do. You can find Greg on Twitter at IGMHorv77. And Metal Witch Sketchbook Project. Thank you so much for believing in us and what we do. And you have such a cool name. And Rachel Ross, you can find Rachel Ross on Twitter at NYC Terrace, T-E-R-I-S. These will all be linked in the show notes, by the way. Thank you, Rachel. And Mike White, find Mike White at Mike White Robot uh, on Instagram. Thank you, Mike, for believing us in what we do. And finally, Dave Sree Say. Uh, Dave Say, the creator of the Emergent Task Planner, provided so much value in our lives and supports the show at Patreon.com. Oh, you can find Dave at on Twitter at Dave Say. Join us at patreon.com slash lean into art. Also get you access to our lean into art discord um, special channels. Thanks to everybody who supports us there. It, it, it means a lot to us. It really did. It really does. Thank you so much. All right. Time yeah. for the, the, I need a sound to get us to the second part of the show. There we go. Before we start recording, we were talking about Atari 2600. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's an evocative that's a- noise. Happy Pac-Man. That's a, uh, it was like video games had the, um, you, so you, you'd have cover art that was evocative as heck. Yep. Right. Yep. And then you would have the interaction, the interactive experience would be so abstract. 
<laughs> like, remember that thing? Hey, this could have been based on a different interactive experience. It's yeah, we had to abstract it. <laughs> Pac-Man, yeah, Pac-Man looks like a wrench now or like the head of a crescent wrench at best. <laughs> totally. And, and the yeah. animation is that like the mouth just like, like you said, like it's like a wrench opening and closing. It doesn't actually open like a pie. Um, my, my favorite example and everybody's favorite example from Atari 2600 was Adventure where like on the cover mm. there's a, this amazing coiling dragon spinning off into the, the the distance you see like a little knight about to face it in a castle off far in the distance and then you turn it on there's no music you're a yellow square standing in front of what looks like a lego castle maybe <laughs> you know <laughs> what do you do now i don't know like there's literally no uh procedure or training in any way just like move around see what you find <laughs> Yeah. Anyway. You, yeah. Use the heck out of your imagination for sure. It's, um, you know, which is, that's, that's cool. Um, strong bad does an excellent job with that as a recurring concept. Too. Oh, that's true. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> your head explode. Okay. But we, mm. we made a promise in this section that we were going to explore, you know, like choosing a strategy, thinking about like, how do we approach this in a systemic way? We've established a lot of like wants, needs, goals, um, even thinking about like what the different parties get out of the thing. Now what, you know, how do we look at this? Mm. So, uh, one option is to not look at it. Does this have to be a big deal? Right. Um, is it, if it's really presenting no big risk, then, uh, why not just get, you know, make it happen, try it, put it on your schedule, right? This, um, if, you know, if, in, if, unless there's some obvious, like, well, this really is leading to trade-offs and, and, and this commitment takes away my part of my, enough of my capacity where it really does affect other commitments and stuff like that. Um, if, if it really is so low cost and so low risk, then, you know, is it something equivalent to saying like, um, doing some playful warm up sketch is so low cost. If you commit to doing that, it doesn't really hurt your other projects. Right. I, I had uh, a couple relatives in my youth. It was like right after I learned how to drive and I was going to go 30 miles out of town. Right. Not, not a, a tremendous distance. And these two relatives, they were not immediate relatives. They were distant relatives, but they, they were, they got into such a heated argument about which was the right way to go that would take you by the cheapest gas stations and shave three minutes off of your your time, you know? And they're, like, screaming at each other. It was a husband and wife. I won't say who they are because in case they ever watch it, but they're screaming at each other about it. And I, as a 16-year-old, like, 16 year old, I'm like, I could just take the highway and I'll be there in 25 minutes. Uh, what what? Why is this so important? <laughs> but you'll save four cents on gas if you go this way. I'm like... Yeah, I think about that, right? It's like, am I doing that when I'm making decisions? <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Okay, so I'm. I think I'm just gonna borrow that. Like, as the, the is this the four cents on gas f- <laughs> fight uh, character in my head? Because I don't. I don't. You know, I don't need to go there. I could just try the thing. Yeah. And, right. Uh, right. Yeah. I could take the highway. So. Um, is this, is this that, right? That that's literally like one of the things like we can get in our own way with, yeah. with all kinds of things when we're, you know, we're, you're, you're making a thing. Um, it's not, everything has to be, um, like a huge process. Yeah. Yeah. And it, 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 this is, yes. Thank you for that. Because like we make a lot of noise at the top of every episode, or I make a lot of noise. Like we think hard about this stuff. So you will too. Right. And it's like, well, <laughs> There's also like just get in there and play and learn from doing it a little bit because it, 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 this goes to the whole idea of like try to describe the sensation of skiing to somebody who's never done it. Well, there's there's a point at which you have to just do it to get the context so that you can more thoughtfully engage with it. And you can't stand outside of an experience and abstract like what are all the pros and cons of doing it before going in. Right. That's. Yeah, right on. I mean, you we can we can sort of talk ourselves out of just you know the out of the very act that can help us make a better decision where mm. it's 
you know, there could be just a little bit of doing here and all of a sudden you've got real data or not, or you just, just keep rolling because you don't need to turn this into data, but you probably do. Right. That's, <laughs> I mean, that's, that's a good thing to start the section where it's like, I mean, on, on one hand, I mean, for your, for your project, is that attempting framing to say that, is this really a big thing? Yeah. Yeah. No, I think that's, that's really useful. There's a lot of, cause like you got me thinking like, okay, well, I've, I've asked myself what it would get in the way of with my art and established what the trade-offs are and made that at least semi-concrete so that I can look for those, look for that when it happens. Um, but then I'm thinking about, okay, well, what other areas of my life? Well, this is going to mean that when I'm drawing, I'm going to be shutting the door to the studio and I'm basically asking my wife and family to leave me alone for that time. Whereas like when I'm drawing without live streaming, there's the implication that I'm still accessible, right? So there's a tension there, a potential tension, right? Um, it changes the nature of how my work interacts with the rest of my life. Um, I'm not going to be answering the phone. Um, any emails or somebody's like, I need this taken care of right away. It's going to wait till after I'm done. Um, I'm prioritizing a group of people over everybody else when I do that. That's worth thinking about. Um, is that a big deal? Doesn't seem like it's something that's so scary that I can't try it. Let's try it. Right. So, um, and, and if you did want to think deeper about it, because th this whole section wasn't like a surprise twist gotcha to be like, we told you we're going we're gonna to think about it and we're so going to think about it. Psych, we're not thinking about it. Psych. <laughs> we're checking out. Um, <laughs> so if you did, because that, that framing too could say, could just be encouraging saying like, well, I can at least do an experiment that's not going to just, you know, mess up my plans that bad, right? This is, right. it's okay. But if I want to be thoughtful about this endeavor and frame it uh, among a few different areas of inquiry, right? So break a big problem down, um, you know, this mysterious system, let's clarify aspects of it. So it's a, it's a more known, um, we have a more, let's see, um, like a useful basis to examine and explore. Um, like, and, and having established at the top of this, that I have noticed that I feel more motivated to do a thing when I can clearly define the benefits it provides to an audience and the benefit it provides to me and the community that I care about. This is all, yeah. all me going back to the, the, the Stenzinger coat of arms, which we've talked about a zillion times on the show, which is like just such a great, um, articulation of a sort of a flow chart to, to evaluate whether or not something you want to take something on. Um, I'm just saying that given that I notice I feel more integrated into the work and, and intrinsically motivated to show up and do it when all those pieces are in place, how do I now take this new thing I'm thinking about and find ways to um, begin to integrate it in a more holistic fashion so that I have that? Mm. How? Well, uh, there's approach we've talked about before, and uh, this is uh, taking the the big concern and dividing it up into three areas, and and each one of these is a an avenue to explore. So considering the, this as a Venn diagram, as it's often seen, it but this is very. Let's see, there's there's a lot of critique one can you know dis use to dismiss it or whatnot, but. Um, but I, I think it's pretty durable and, and you find the form that works for you of what's feasible, what is viable and what is desirable. So something feasible, it means that you, it's, it's the, it's the making aspect of it. It's the um, like, are you ready? Do you have the resources and stuff and time and skill to build this thing? Right. Uh, is it feasible with your current equipment, your current, um, environment your and your current um you know habits and practice and what have you feasibility means it can be built right and it can and in, in such a way that you believe in it right so your criteria as a maker it's not like if 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 you don't want to just duct tape and bubble gum this but you can really do the thing whatever you believe in as is what defines feasibility it's not what i'm describing as feasibility it's what I'm describing feasibility so you can come up with your own feasible criteria, right? Uh, 
Mm-hmm. And, and uh, also viability. Viability is that you put this into the world. It seems like it's likely that you can engage in trade with it. Like there's an audience there and they want to trade in value with you for it, right? There's an audience of whether it's attention economy type stuff where you're turning, you know, eyeballs into money in some aspect, or if you're doing, um, you know, some direct transaction or a bunch of different types of transactions, whatever it is, it's, um, one way to look at it is, is does this exist in the real world as a business model, right? That, that works, right? And your own criteria can come into play there, right? So if it's um, ways that you believe in making money and this project, do you see that happening, right? So viability, however you define viability, um, and also that it would mean like, is it very, it's like whatever you find is compatible. If you're like, well, I can get paid really well to do this thing and it's a trade-off because this and that, but I can get paid well to fund, you know, to pay the rent and stuff, right? Mm-hmm. Whatever it is, it's worth addressing that as a separate concern, okay? Then it's uh, the, the desirability aspect of, of thinking of, um, so do people somehow want and ask you specifically to do this thing. Uh, have you seen evidence and somehow of, of um, you know, some positive signal about um, people want to hire you and doing the thing that you make in the way that you make it, right? In the way that you provide it. The experience of sharing your thing, uh, people recognize that as a good experience and whatnot, right? So it's really putting that, the criteria in your, in your audience and saying that is there, um, your, your audience from the standpoint of, um, you know, wanting, wanting that, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah, the, the, if there, if there's a, if there's already a market, that's kind of a general signal with that includes the audience, because if I go back to viability, it, it's also like whatever you do, if it takes you a ton of effort and that may make something not viable because you're like, well, to get this to the place where I know I can sell it, uh, that just is too much effort for me or whatever, right? That makes it not viable, right? Mm-hmm. It's the whole like the value trade is, is, is off there. But the desirable is that that specific you know, signal from an audience kind of thing of, of um, being recognizing what you're doing, wanting what you're doing, that kind of thing. And I feel like that third one is something that I wouldn't be able to engage with when I was 19 and first starting out in comics. Uh, Yeah. I had some classmates in high school who said like, you draw good, you know, but like I had no contact with the world at large about what I was doing as a cartoonist that, connected with anybody until I started making some mini comics and going to festivals. Um, so the, that third factor, am, am I reading this right? That like some experimentation has to happen before you can really assess that one. And well, do you bring up a good point? So how do you get, how do you get informed with any of these? Right. Because it takes some kind of research in every bit of it, right. Mm -hmm. Where you're doing some kind of analysis on what you're, what, um, what you're doing as far as, you know, is this feasible and all that, is it viable and and whatnot from, from you personally, but then you want signal from the outside world in, in pretty much all of it. Right. Because even if you, if you're like, um, I think it's a, it's a, it's a useful thing to note that like, well, huh. There's, there's overlap in all of these, right? So part of the, is it buildable will affect desirable, right? So it's a Venn diagram, there's overlap, right? So like if it's feasible and desirable, that means you like to build it. And also, you know, people recognize it. You, you don't mind the tools that get this in front of people, all that kind of stuff, right? Um, so anyway, how do you get the data? How do you, how do you examine this? Um, you mentioned being 19 in high school, but it's, if you were 19 in high school and were presented this kind of 
question or this way of looking at things, you might, it, upon reflection, find signals, find data of like, um, <laughs> when uh, I did, I did one of the things, I, my early things, I, I pieces of art I sold, it was, um, I traded a drawing of Wolverine for a butterfly knife, right? And um, it was a... It's uh, appropriate. <laughs> <laughs> it's so, it's, yeah, many levels. Teenage Rob um, did a very, yeah, did, did a fan art drawing of Wolverine. It was, yeah, very moody, whatever. I thought it was pretty solid. And, um, and in, you know, someone wanted that and they paid me in a, a form of a, a brand new um, butterfly knife. Anyway, that's a signal, right? I could be like, um, okay, what have I been paid for to do? What have I um, been recognized where the, you know, cause part of that desirability is, is how do you get this out of hypothetical and into, you know, practical and, and whatnot. So someone's recognized you for something, even at 19, right? Mm -hmm. Whatever age. Yeah. So Yeah. What yeah. does that tell you as it relates to this project? Right. It could be that, well, I've, I've designed you, maybe you've designed t-shirts that um, have nothing to do with your current project. <laughs> um, but you've, you know, is, did you learn anything there that has that, that's something you can port over to say like, yeah, it, I, I can do, I can present things in a way that people are willing to buy. I better make my product pages related to this comic in a similar way or whatever. Right. Okay. Okay. There could be anyway. So, um, how could you get data? So like you, Jersey, thinking about what's feasible, viable, and desirable, how could you get data on this to help you? Um, well, desirability better. is that like, I'm getting emails from institutions asking me to do, uh, video presentations for them. Like libraries and universities are sending me query letters saying like, Hey, we know that you present well please do a thing about comics for us. So I know that there's something, and I'm teaching a couple of online classes right now where I'm like, even though we're two, three weeks in, I'm accruing new students. Um, I know there's something about the way I talk and present about comics that is interesting and entertaining to certain constituencies. Um, so I've got that. And does that relate to this project? So the video aspect relates to it too, but like, are you going to make what's entertaining about that thing, mm -hmm. uh, those other projects w as part of this. Right, 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 right. And so now I got to ask myself, well, what makes the, the teaching work so desirable? What am I doing in there? That, and, and this would be something where I could put out some surveys to actually the students, which I should do. Um, but also, um, watch the room in the moments where they seem to really respond to me, you know? Um, you have, you have another twist here too, is mm -hmm. that you're doing this project in a way to support another project. Mm -hmm. So then I would say, what is the storyboard? You could call it a journey map. You, what is the sequence of someone interacting with project a to connect it to project B? Mm -hmm. How do they get there? Mm -hmm. Is there more than one path? Um, are you going to set that up to make that actually like a, an intentional uh, thing? So in order, like, like to, in a way to design whatever you're creating the experience of that streaming video to, to be likely to get the outcomes you want. So, mm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so will you insert verbal links or what other mechanisms? Um, Oh gosh. Yeah. Yeah. I've already come up with ideas. I don't want to say <laughs> it's like, okay, that's a good idea. <laughs> let's, let's, let's play with that and see if we can create something that's a little bit unique. Um, oh my gosh. Yeah. 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 Okay. But connecting those two projects. Like, so it can't just, you know, it, you can um, like, think of all this different, have you ever like, so, so growing up um, seeing, seeing someone who is a um, like an actor in a thing. And then you hear like, Oh, this actor has a band too. And you're like, eh, mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. Good. Good for them. I'm glad. Or did you think like, I have to check this out. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's the case of like that person has a side project that isn't really bridged. 
mm-hmm. and connecting. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you're right. Okay. But, but like, you know, making a game that also has a soundtrack, it's possible to, you know, like really connect those two things well. And then some, some games do that very well, where it's like there's a purchable, purchasable second aspect to this experience. Yeah. Uh, and we connect them. I mean, you, there's a link to the store, there's whatever. Yeah. Anyway, mm, mm, but mm. purposefully connect it, That's a complication. So you, cause you, you do this feasible, viable, desirable, desirable exercise for one project that's, that stands alone sort of, right. Not really as your career overall, but when you think about it, you're, you're doing the heavy lifting only about that project. But then if you have a two that are meant to serve one another, you end up having to sort of do this exercise again and find those bridges as far as how does, how do these, they make one another feasible? How do they make one another viable? How do they make one another desirable? And mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Okay. Yes. So. There, 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 there is material that I'm creating in my classroom that could be hmm. literally repurposed in an art stream and hmm. in ways that would make the performance better and easier to do. Uh, like I, I, what you, one of the things that you're pointing at too, is like this, uh, something I looked at when making the super comics challenge project was I knew that as a host, I was going to face attention of thoughtfully engaging with the artist as they performed their, their challenge, as they drew pointing to the mm-hmm. teachable moments while also being entertaining and in engaging and thoughtful to, uh, raise up the artist, really like, like make people more aware of this person. And so I said, I can't do that on my own and do all the switching. I need an assistant. I need a, a, a co-host slash commentator to do that part. It, it take, take the reins and be the, the first person doing that part. I can chime in, but they're taking the heat off me so I can do this other part like with all my attention. I think about that's how do I use material I already have to assist me in the facilitation and hosting of an art stream? Yeah, that's an interesting idea. That's really, that's really, really good. Okay. Um, do we have any final thoughts on this before we go to our our second break and then talk about two minute practice? Uh, let's see. I think it's worth mentioning. So we're using a lot of same similar criteria that we've we've talked about. I think there's the minimum viable product episode. Mm-hmm. Um, that's a whole. Um, I actually recently did a Polytechnic cast about minimum viable product and like all that, it's a mechanism to learn, right? So it's jargon. It gets all jar, jargon goes through hot and cold. It's, it, you know, it's in, it's out, you, you know, everyone wants to do this. Everyone who does that sucks. Don't do it. And, uh, but it's a useful mechanism for learning. And if it's just jargon about learning, it's fine. If you want to learn about your business and your art endeavors, is there, I, so think, think about ways where you can, explore this and uh, make, make, you know, an informed path, right? Whatever, whatever you do next, it's like, you're going to try this, this product. Awesome. Um, it helps you become more confident in, in continuing with it. Right. So just being thoughtful about that, setting yourself up to get a feedback loop by saying, I have a hypothesis and here's how I'm going to test it and whatnot. Uh, then reflect on it and then actually make choices based on what you learn. Right. Mm -hmm. Because that's one of the huge things that we can, we can um, lose the benefit of all this thoughtfulness is to um, just be too busy to not keep engaging with it. So some kind of check in with yourself, some kind of basis, right. Put this into the world, have some questions about it, discover, learn, adapt, uh, but it takes but it takes time to invest in that as a system overall of when you're when you're trying a new thing. Um, so yeah, and there's a whole episode, uh, another episode about this. Um, I forget which number, but yeah, go to leanintoart.com, search for MVP or minimum viable product. I will look them up and put them in the show notes when I post this cool. episode. Um, okay. Yeah. Well, Rob, this was really, really helpful. Um, this was this was exactly what I needed to do to start to frame up my thinking as I very, very slowly approach the uh, the autumn 
and think about, you know, how I can start to position this project and make it into something that hopefully gets some traction. However, however it gets made. Um, I appreciate it. Appreciate your, you know. Oh, thank you. I, I, I love doing this kind of, um, it basically, this is one of my, <laughs> one of my favorite things to do is to talk with people about what they're making and how they're engaging with it and whatnot. Right. So I love it. Like that, that we, that sometimes that's one of the mechanisms of our show. I, so thank you as well. <laughs> well, I mean, and also modeling this idea is like, this, this is where you showed your side hustle. Like, Oh, Rob also was in a band, but like you actually like, got a, a taste of what that band is like, which is like a way of, of bridging us into talking about our, our second uh, ad break. We gotta think some more people make the show possible. And those people are us. We make the show possible. We make lots of things that we hope you will engage with. Uh, and we, we think really hard when we make that stuff and we bring that, those thoughts into this project called Lean Into Art. And the thing that I make that I hope you'll check out this week is this side hustle sort of for fun project I do called Four Million Years Later, where it is a podcast where me and my buddy Hoover, friend of 25 plus years, um, spent most of that 25 years talking about the Transformers together on the phone. And we decided to start doing an episode by episode uh, watch along of the entire Generation One series. And we are now on episode 29, the Insecticon Syndrome. Um, and we talk about it from the perspective of how we engaged with it as children. And then we also talk about it from the perspective as, of adults, uh, as adults. And actually, the one I hope you'll check out is episode 28, A Prime Problem, because that's an interesting one for me because I really didn't like the episode as a child. But as an adult, I really love the episode. So it's interesting to see how um, what we react to, how our perspectives change, um, what we showed up for as children and what we show up for entertainment as adults. Um, and it's a lot of like the kind of story analysis I like to do. And it's a little bit of me sometimes projecting onto the story analysis and kind of wishing for things there. Um, but it's, it's joyful, it's fun. And, uh, you can find it at 4 million years later.com. Now, if you enjoyed this discussion that Rob and I have been having, I think you should check out Rob Stenzinger.com slash store.html because Rob. Oh, well, I offer, I, I offer coaching services. So yeah, I'm a, I'm a trained life coach. I tend to apply this toward the um, process of, well, helping individuals and teams make meaningful products. Um, one, of your, one of your products as a person is your career path. Whatever that narrative is of the adventures you've taken and where you go next, what products you choose to make next or focus on or what priority, um, all kinds of things can get in the way of that. And I offer coaching and, and that's, that's a, that's a, a mechanism of exploring a topic where it's not about being prescriptive. Yeah. I've made a lot of different things and uh, I've worked in like large and small organizations and I bring that experience, but the coaching is really about, um, tuning into like where you're at with what you're, what you're doing and your, like you have the answers in you and it's just that we get in our own way. Um, there you go. So it's a bit of, uh, it's consulting when it's needed, but, but mostly coaching, which is all about helping you navigate your own choices. And, and that could be you individually or as a team, then, then it's about, um, you know, uh, the meaningful products. How, how, how do teams, you know, get, uh, find their path or get lost about, uh, making things with their audience and with each other. And that's, uh, there's a lot of great things to explore there. And I'm happy to help facilitate those conversations. Just go to robstenzinger.com slash store.html. You get some more descriptions about these things and uh, yeah, reach out to me and we can set something up. That's great. Uh, so yes, robstenzinger.com slash store.html. You just saw uh, like a little taste of what it, what it's like. Um, and then the other thing we hope you'll check out is the Lean Into Art Discord. Yes, we have a forum now. So if you uh, want to converse, communicate with us, comment on shows from past episodes and uh, current episodes, if you want to watch the live stream, you can uh, join our Patreon and get access to the Patreon live stream channel on our Discord. And the invite link is in the show notes for this episode and every episode. Thanks to everybody who has been hanging out there and sharing their work and supporting one another. It's been marvelous to get to know you and see you all interacting with one another in the Discord. It's a great place. Yeah, it's it's a lot of fun, and uh, yeah, I'm glad it's here. And it's it's this special 
uh, type of like we, we're experimenting with broadcasting in Discord as and and actually letting the letting the stream roll a bit as we're setting up and whatnot too. So you get some um, you know little bit of setup. The, we talked uh, we had a lot of fun talking about um, old PC, you know, PC building and stuff like that today, for example. Yeah. And uh, and yeah. Anyway, it's 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 a great place um, worth checking out. I had one more thing. I, I, I want to mention that I'm working on an update to Guitar Fretter Classic, right? So you can learn more about Guitar Fretter to, you know, go to guitarfretter.com, but uh, it's also, it's just available at itch.io, right? So just, um, you can, you can go there. It's for, you know, the, the Windows and Mac version I'll be updating in the next couple of days. Oh, so there's, yeah, it's, I've been working on like, there's a little bit of performance update and also, um, with different screen sizes and stuff, um, there's so many resolutions and so many different kinds of screens. I've, I've had guitar fretter has been sort of a cutoff, like portion of a fretboard of, of, a of a guitar. And, um, let me, let me just show you my, my window here too. Okay. So you get a, you get a taste for the, like what's coming. So if I go to I don't think you're you're hearing the audio. I'm not. I but I I had to uh, pause as I was hearing it quite loud in my head. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you notice that um, that essentially the um, all right. It's hard to play and talk at the same time. <laughs> but I added there's a headstock and body now, and there's there's higher contrast visually. Um, like the fretboard, right? Mm. So the fretboard is easier to see and um, and it's giving you a preview of like guitar art that's coming in the new version of Guitar Fretter as well, right? So the, um, you know, all the different screens and whatnot, the, there, there used to be that floating fretboard depending mm-hmm. on your, your device, right? So some devices, you never knew that it was just floating there as a cutoff, you know, art asset right now it's the entire guitar and no matter what size screen it's it's got um a better look for you so that's happening plus some other tweaks and stuff um and it actually gave me an idea where i for sure will have at least one more update coming after that too and it's um it's a game that makes it makes a memory match game out of out of um this little action puzzle of matching the notes on guitar fretboard and the little little um you know minions that come down floating on the screen you try to keep you know keep your health in 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 kind of traditional arcade style and that's it and it's it's really it's been around it's actually just celebrated 10th birthday right been updating it that wow. whole time now and then and uh i know that there's still an audience for it so i'm happy to to get this update out to everyone everyone who ha- owns it already will get this right um just will take me a while to get it to the android and the ios store as well but it'll get there. And um, yeah, just knowing and, and interacting with and buying Guitar Fretter is helping fund the sequel. And there's lots of awesome stuff that I'll share down the road about that. But I just wanted to make you aware that this That's is awesome. happening. Next couple of days so, yeah. at, the, at the time of this recording, which means probably by the time you're listening to this, it's out. Itch.io, guitarfretter.com. Mm-hmm. All right. That's what I had to share. Okay. Great. So is it time for the two-minute practice? I think it is. So, hey, Jersey. Hey, Rob. Time to talk about practicing. Two-minute practice time. Yeah. Yeah, Right on. So, uh, gosh, we're, what, we're on number 20 now? Where for, you know, roughly 20 weeks or so-ish, we've been doing this thing where uh, this adding that a, a tiny experience into your day where you try something two minutes at a time. And a lot of times it's a creative thing or just puts you in a different mindset or uh, gosh, we've done, we've done a few physical ones too. I think mm-hmm. we did. We did some fitness ones, self care. Yeah. So it's been a fun mix, but um, so yeah. W- what did we do last time, Jersey? This uh, so last we, we always talk about the one we just did, and mm-hmm. then we think of a new one to do every yeah. episode. So, 
So the last what? one was inspired by some stuff I was seeing in my Instagram feeds where uh, different artists were posting like just uh, the same shape like f- four to six times and just mapping different faces onto the same shape over and over again. And I thought that's that's something that looks like fun that I've never done. Um, I, I would like to try that. And it seems like something that would be very low cost. Again, just a way to have a little creative break in the day and you know, introduce some different thinking that I haven't been doing with my art. So uh, I, I did a couple sessions. It turned out to take a little longer than I thought. I have I have one incomplete <laughs> one. So I, I, I did not beat the clock. Um, oh, and, that's okay. Um, <laughs> like, like, how did that go? Like, what was the extra ambition or what have you? Um, well, let me pull up my overhead cam and we can see. So here, I, I did them on sticky ah. notes again. And... I, I recently got from jetpens.com a um, a green fountain pen just for the, the pure fun of it. Um, I, I, I still have my multi-pen and I love my multi-pen with all my heart, but this has become my uh, note-taking pen at my desk all the time. What, what kind is it? It is called a Olika. I don't know if that shows up on the camera, but oh. anyway, so it was part of it for me was like, oh, this will give me an excuse to use this fun new fountain pen that I have that I'm, I'm loving so much, but... I mean, I started out with it. One of the things I noticed is that it became challenging. Certain shapes became challenging to repeat. Like I, I noticed that the, sh- the shapes changed a little bit from drawing to drawing. And, and I would think like in retrospect, I would have maybe have done better had I done it digitally and just copy and pasted the shape. Um, but what I did is I, I, I started the timer and then I drew the first shape and then tried to quickly copy it uh, uh, six times. Um, but This one, I started running out of time towards the end. So the next Mm -hmm. practice session, um, I was like, okay, let's just try to do five. And even then, like this shape was such a difficult one to figure out, like how do I put faces on it uh, that I I ran out of time before I could get to the last one. So I have one blank shape. But I managed to do what? 12, 13, 40, 50, 16 faces in three sessions. Not too bad. Um, Nice. And if I were to make an art observation, it asked me to to think about cartooning in a way that I don't typically do. I, I don't do oh, a lot of, really? Yeah, I don't do a lot of like really truly cartoony cartooning. You know? Like when I look at some of these faces like this this little baby with a giant forehead or this well like this woman who's she almost looks like a like, like kind of like a puppy dog. Or like this one with like mm. the exceedingly long nose um as I tried to map her face on this shape. Um it's not a way I, I tip or, or this guy where I turn like the whole top lump of the shape into like a gigantic nose uh, or this character with who now has ears way high on his head. I, I don't I don't usually draw in this in this this style in this approach. I don't think about cartooning in this way. So it was it was it was fun and refreshing to engage in a kind of cartooning that I don't normally do. Uh, what about you, Rob? Oh, that's really that's really fun. Uh, and it's uh that's um that's pretty cool where though yeah the whole point of this i mean that sounds like it was like would you say that that was a successful practice then mm-hmm. like yeah i would like say for the two minute practice it like yes it seems to have really you know brought out something new right yeah and, it, it, uh, it put me in touch with something in a very cursory way that didn't feel terribly threatening right like if you were asking me to like draw in that cartoony style to do a whole comic strip i'd be like Ugh, i don't know you're asking me to take on a lot of decision making up front Whereas this was just like, just play with it for two minutes. And it's like, okay, yep, I don't, I don't do it. There, there were a couple of the practices where I was on the last head and I was like, what am I, what do I do with this? I don't know what to do with this, you know? And there was like a f- three or four seconds of me sort of flop sweating. Um, it's, it's safe to flop sweat in a two minute practice, you know? So. Uh, that's okay. That's, that's pretty cool. I, um, I, I succeeded in doing two practices with this and um, let's see, I'm going to switch to my desktop. Um, <laughs> so I did that digital thing where, where um, I ended up making a shape, copying it quickly. And uh, oh gosh, what's that app? An iPad app that I just love for um it's, it's like my favorite silhouette app and i will remember it here is it uh it's it's ink ink pad hmm. i always forget the name 
always forget the name of Inkpad, but um, but it's it's a really nice simplified UI vector tool, and you can set it up by default where it just closes a shape, so you can just simply do a quick, you know, swoosh of your your pen, and instantly it fill, it's filled in, right? Mm. And if I want, I could do a couple swooshes to make a silhouette and what have you, and it's it's just um, it's a, it's a neat like visual development exploration tool that I always keep coming back to. And so that really popped into mind for this. And so that was part of, I, I would, I have to admit, I cheated. Basically I created my a little template and then I, in which didn't take long. So I probably could have squeezed this all in two minutes, but it took long enough where I, and it was an extra step. I didn't start the timer until I, I made that. And then I cut and pasted it into a, like a, a, a more, sketching drawing app okay Uh, and that's when i said okay start the timer and then i would do you know i I succeeded in you know two different times doing that for drawing you know four heads and um and i would say yeah cartoony is is a place i'm i'm pretty comfortable in but it's um but it's still this and having seen a lot of the similar posts that you were you you probably saw jersey Mm -hmm. that led, led up to this thing uh you know, I, I saw a lot of the, like where you change the eye line, right? The eye mm. line is like a huge strategy. It's like, where, where are the, eye, where are the eyes going to go? And then, um, you know, what kind of eye shape will I do? What kind of nose or is there a nose? And then that kind of thing is, is what led to, uh, you know, this, this happening. And then I realized that, that I was, you know, drawing a lot of characters without hair and I bet I wanted to somehow throw some hair in, <laughs> but it's just super scribbly <laughs> playing around little bit of emotion not not i guess i guess each of these does have a different emotion too Mm -hmm. um that happened i did not plan that (laughs) (laughs) um so let's go to the other one oh yeah yeah you're moving the eye line up and down yep and this is uh it's just you know throw throwing that uh you know four instances of a shape uh, dropping the opacity down and then scribbling away with a, a simple, um, simple pen. But uh, yeah, that's interesting. So like, like the first three, this is the first one I actually drew actually this one. So, and, and it starts where like those three could be the, could be the same character really. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, just playing with the eyeline and then getting weird with a, a brainy one at the end. <laughs> and um, it would just, it was relaxing. That's my, my big takeaway with this is that doing cartoony stuff is comforting and relaxing for me. Mm. And um, I think I need to remember that. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think that uh, I could use the practice of going in a more cartoony style just for the sheer purpose of having more versatility in my work. So. Mm-hmm. So, there's so a- that's okay. Cartoony style. That's what's funny. It's like some, some of the shapes you drew it, one of those characters, it totally reminded me of, uh, something I found visually arresting. Okay. Which one it's the, um, the lower left, uh, sticky note and the third character from the top, right. Um, mm-hmm. totally reminds me of a, a character from the uh, Captain Harlock Endless, Ode- Endless Odyssey uh, anime series, mm-hmm. which was, it's, um, it's, I've, I've really, I just really like that anime. It, it's, it, um, the, you know, the, the story is fun. It's, you know, good adventure, interesting character development, but like for the most part, um, the, the, you know, I don't know. It's I, the story. I remember parts of it when I when I rewatch it, but the visuals and the juxtaposition of 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 the character styles so interesting and the oh, kinds yeah. of yeah yeah just like the extreme cartooniness and the extreme um, stylized human anime general broad brush representations of like of the heroic characters, right? Mm-hmm. But mixed in with these these sort of um, like grotesque added ex- exaggerated um, uh, cartoonish proportion uh, different 
different size characters and like the kind of emotional reality that they would push some of these characters through it was i i think yeah. cranked up because of that cartooniness anyway like that that had you drew it seems like it's a character hmm. right out of right out of captain harlock that's to me. fun uh yeah that, that well that that's so i guess it, it my broad view of my encounter with this week's practice was is that it it took me to a territory that I don't I wouldn't visit on purpose on my own it introduced me mm. to a visual vocabulary that I realized I could expand upon a little bit um to what end I don't know but that's the point of practice right is this to like explore and see um so mm -hmm. at least this at least this practice uh so what do you want to do with this week? Let's see. So we've been succeeding in switching things up. Um, is there like, is there something that we unearth that we want to dig into with this, which two minutes is hard to dig deeper with, right? It's a mm -hmm. tight constraint. Mm -hmm. So, like one question, I think this is beyond the the scope, but would be how like how could you juxtapose a um, a realistic character with a cartoonish character, mm. and what 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 kind of tensions pop up there? What mm -hmm. do you what do you see? What do you learn? Yeah, that'd be tough to fit um, into two minutes. Um, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What do you want to do another drawing one or do you want to do something that's more of a writing one or a physical one? Uh, we've done a couple of writing ones recently and we just did True. a drawing one. Physical does pop out as a good idea. Like, is there like, what are you doing as far as like ergonomics practice or that kind of thing? <laughs> Not a lot. You know, as a matter of fact, I just went, I just had a, uh, my first telehealth doctor appointment because I uh, goofed up my wrist in moving house you know, and it's like, oh, okay, no. I'm not, no, I, I'm, I'm fine. I'm on an anti-inflammatory. It's just, it's a, it feels like it's just a, 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 a tendonitis kind of thing that could be, going to be brought down with like icing it and stuff. So not a huge deal. My drawing hand still works. Um, but it, it reminded me that like, yeah, I am not getting any younger and I got to start taking care of the machine a little bit more, uh, carefully and thoughtfully. So yeah, something about, um, maybe even just sitting straight for two minutes, just sitting with your spine straight for two minutes and seeing how that changes mm. your, your interaction. So with how do, how would you do that? Would you just try to do this in a, like in wherever you're at in a chair mm -hmm. or, well, I mean, I'm at, okay. I'm at this desk most of the day anyway, right? A lot of us are at art desks, uh, even when we're doing our side hustle or some kind of, you know, computer desk. So, um, I noticed that when I'm drawing digitally, I'm very hunched over the table, you know, um, mm. even though I can zoom in pretty darn big, you know, so why, why am I not working with more of a straight back? I just got a, uh, a kneeling chair, which is like my favorite kind of chair because there's no mm. back on it. Um, mm -hmm. and I do notice that I tend to sit straighter when I sit in this kind of a chair, but it, you know, I got to take breaks from it cause my knees after a while, but, um, mm. But yeah, I mean, I like this. I did. So I, what I'm seeking is like, I'm sold. I think it's really cool. So I do, I stand most of the day ah. at my desk. And so I'm trying to, I'm like exploring, like, so would I just go sit with my back against a wall for two minutes or, or I guess maybe that's not about being prescriptive. It's just to sit for two minutes, however you want with the intention of, well, um, have a, having a, a um, healthy posture straight back, let your shoulders drop. Think about your that kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I also noticed that, uh, I have, you know, there's a chair in our living room that I crash on at the end of the day. And I totally do the thing where like my spine is like, like looped where I'm like my, my waist is at the end of the chair and my shoulders are like down where my waist should be in the chair. And, uh, that also is problematic after a while. So like it would probably do me good to just take a moment to remind myself, like sit in the chair, the way it's designed, sit straight just for a little bit and so, feel your posture. You know, yeah, we're not doctors. Um, finding Thank you for that. Like, yeah. so two minutes for whatever works for you, healthy posture. There That's, we go. Um, nice. Great job thinking of a, a good physical one. I'm, I'm looking forward to this one too now. All right. Oh, good. Yeah. 
Thanks, Rob. Thank you, Jersey. So I think we did another episode of the Lena Tarkast. Did we? We did. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I right. think we did. And then just a couple things popped out. We should totally be sponsored by Jet Pens, and they would get a good deal out of that because uh, if we mentioned Jet Pens in the the uh, two minute practice podcast that also gets, you know, reshared as its own separate, it's a segment on the main show, but it's, it's also its own show. Mm-hmm. So that's a deal. That is a deal. Sponsor. It's a twofer as they say. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, that's my, one of my takeaways here, but that no, was fun. <laughs> Thank you, Jersey for this conversation. And uh, it's, yeah, it's, it gave me a lot of good food for thought too. And I appreciate that. Oh, Awesome. Well, we all we all benefited today. That's great. All right, we record this show Thursdays. We stream it live on Discord for now and uh, collect it as a podcast at patreon.com slash leanintoart and leanintoart.com. We'll be back with another episode next week. Uh, thanks, everybody, for hanging out with us and downloading, listening, and watching. Until next time, I have been Jersey Drozd of leanintoart.com and Jersey Drozd on Instagram. And I've been Rob Stenzinger, also of leanintoart.com. And I'm Rob Stenzinger, lots of places, like Instagram. Okay, bye. Show notes for this episode can be found at leanintoart.com. You can also follow us on Twitter at the user leanintoart. And you can reach us via email at leanintoart at gmail.com. And remember, leaners aren't wieners. Thanks for listening.